weight gain, body composition, fat gain, metabolism, muscle loss, all the things that kind of plague us as we get older. And so weight gain, the topic of weight gain is a huge issue for women as they enter the menopause transition. It's probably one of the top questions and concerns that I get on a daily basis in my Instagram DMs, on Facebook, on TikTok, in my support emails. All the women I talk to, they are very concerned about their expanding weight waistlines, about cellulite, about weight gain. And it's not surprising because in the United States, where I am in the United States, over 42% of women who are over the age of 40 are actually classified as obese. So not just overweight, but obese. And so what is going on? Well, quite frankly, if you live like a normal quote unquote normal lifestyle and you kind of go with the flow and you eat out at a restaurant and you kind of go, you know, to the office and you do what everybody else does at the office and you go home and you do what your family does, that kind of sets you up for being a little bit overweight because most of the food at restaurants is like high fat, high calorie, large portions. You go to the office, they've got pastries and candy and junk food. You go home, everyone's sitting down on the couch, eating chips, snacking. And there's not a lot of physical activity because now we can shop online. We can do our work online. We drive everywhere. Like nobody's walking. Like if you walk, you're kind of, it's almost like you're weird. And if you're the person that always goes to the gym, you're a little bit like you're the strange one. If you're the one ordering, like, can I get the dressing on the side? You're kind of like a little uncomfortable at, your, if you're at the restaurant with all your friends because you're the only one doing those strange things, but you almost have to do the strange things in order to stay fit and healthy in today's society. And so, and then as our hormones change, we also have the lack of benefit. So the detriment is that in women from age 30 onward, we lose about three to 5% of our muscle mass per decade. And so that is like every 10 years. So every 10 years, you're going to lose between three and 5% of your muscle mass, your lean body tissue, your metabolic burning muscle. And then as we enter the menopause transition, so this is perimenopause, as we start that transition where our hormones start to decline, this can be late thirties, early forties, we can lose as much as 2% of our muscle mass per year. And that's just if we don't make any changes in our lifestyle. And so when we lose this muscle mass, what that does is it actually slows down our metabolism because muscle is very metabolically active. In order to maintain your muscle, it requires energy and the energy from the food you eat goes to your muscles and it burns. And if you don't have that muscle, you're more likely to gain weight or have difficulty losing weight. And so the average woman in her thirties who does not lift weights, so just doing the norm, not in the gym strength training, she'll lose about five pounds of muscle and gain five pounds of fat in the next decade. So from age 30 to 40, you will lose five pounds of muscle and gain five pounds of fat just from your hormonal changes. And then what happens is that increased snowballs because now your fat cells are less metabolically active than your muscle cells were. And now the calories that you normally eat, you don't burn as many. So now you're gaining even more weight and you're losing even more muscle. And so what the heck is going on? You're like, what is going on? How do I stop the insanity? Right. And it's because like menopause, there's a drop in estrogen levels. We all know that like your hormones drop, you're going to lose some testosterone, you're going to lose progesterone, you're definitely going to lose estrogen. And that leads to a change in how we store our fat and where we store our fat particularly, and we're going to have more abdominal fat. So if you think about like how men gain weight versus how women gain weight, and if we look at men in their like thirties, twenties, thirties, women are going to gain more weight in their hips and thighs and butt. And then men are going to gain weight in their belly. But when women lose their estrogen, they also gain more weight in their belly as well. In addition to their hips and thighs. And then also, like I said, the metabolic rate, the speed at which you burn calories, that slows down. It really makes losing weight super hard. And it, it's going to really cause also other issues as your metabolism goes down, as you become more, lose more lean body mass and have more fat mass, then you become more at risk for an insulin resistance. You become more at risk for type two diabetes, heart disease, all types of things. And so the important thing to know is it's not inevitable. So if you do nothing, 
you're going to have issues and it's going to be difficult, but, or if you try to do the same things that you always used to do. So here's the problem that I find with most women. And I was the same. You start gaining that weight and you do what you used to do in your twenties. It's like, you just like pull back on eating. Maybe you do an extra workout, maybe you do more cardio and then the weight kind of normalizes. But when your hormones are dropping, that doesn't work as well. It actually kind of backfires on you. As you pull back your calories, you learn to survive on less calories and now your metabolism drops even more. And as you do more cardio, your body is like, oh my God, she's running from a tiger and your cortisol goes up, which raises your insulin resistance, which makes you store more fat. And it's just the hormonal cascade that really causes a lot of problems. So What the heck do we do? Well, there is help. You do not have to just struggle and it can actually be easy. It doesn't have to be, I'm not here to say spend three hours in the gym and only eat like leafy green vegetables and small portions. That's not what this is about at all. So there's like seven to 10 things that I implement in my life. And I recommend to all of my patients to implement in their lives. And the first thing is actually super simple. It's actually like figuring out where you're starting from. So being just real honest with yourself about what are the habits that you're actually, what habits are you actually doing that can be not helping you with your weight and your health? And then what habits can you change? What little tweaks can you make to actually really benefit you? And so things like drinking water, are you actually drinking eight to 12 glasses of water per day, are you? Or are you drinking sugary drinks or iced tea or lemonade? Are you a grazer? Do you like not eat real meals and do you just kind of snack on things? You know, I have an eight-year-old and like, he's a snacker. Well, he's not, it's, he eats a lot of food. And so we have things like, you know, like little crackers and bread and things that like he likes to eat because he's burning a lot of calories all the time. And it's easy to like grab a handful or grab a handful of nuts and then grab this and grab that. And then not really counting it as a meal. And then you look back, you're like, Oh, I haven't eaten all day. Well, you've actually had a lot of calories in those snacks. Or are you drinking a glass of wine every night? Has that glass of wine once in a while turned into a glass of wine every night, turned into two glasses of wine every night? Are you counting those calories? Smoothies, smoothies can be equally, if you, especially if you go to like a smoothie bar, that can be a lot of calories and a lot of sugar. So just like looking at your current situation and just figuring out, okay, where can I improve? Am I getting all of my nutrition? Am I getting all of my macronutrients? Am I getting enough sleep? So sleep is another huge thing that we'll talk about in a little bit, but when we're not sleeping, it actually messes with our hunger hormones and we get more hungry during the day. And we also kind of can slack off on movement and we're not doing as much non-exercise movement. We might be a little bit lazier and that's going to decrease our calorie burn as well. So just getting real at yourself and seeing, okay, what are the things that the small tweaks that I can make? Can I maybe drink some more water instead of having that caloric drink? Or can I add more vegetables to my plate and reduce maybe the carbohydrates or the fats? You know, can I stop putting like processed foods on my plate and maybe eat more whole real foods, whatever it might be, just getting real with, and also your fitness habits. Like, do you get your steps in? Are you active during the day? You find yourself sitting a lot. Maybe you used to like go to the office and you used to have to like, go get to your car, walk to the building, go up flights of stairs, walk back and forth in the office. And maybe now you're sitting at home and you're doing your job from home and you're just in your jammies and you just like got out of your bed and went to like the kitchen counter and that's all where you've been all day. So maybe forcing yourself to go out for walks. So little things like that did. And and it's great to do like, like a meal tracker. If you have access to an app, like my fitness pal or chronometer, lots of free apps online, just use it to just keep note of what you're eating. So you can see not, I'm not just talking about calorie counting. So don't get me wrong here. I really want you to see like how balanced your meals are. If you're eating at regular intervals, if you're skipping meals, if you're eating more than you thought you were, and then tracking your exercise, like how many steps you're getting. If you wear, I wear like a Garmin watch, but you can use a aura ring or a Fitbit or something like that, or just on your phone. If you have like that Apple phone, you can do Apple health. If you carry your phone with you just to get a ballpark idea, I'm not talking about like being real anal about it. So that's one thing. And then another thing is like really thinking about like your nutrition overall and your exercise overall. Right. So 
not trying to out exercise a bad diet. So I have done that before. I used to always say, well, I run so that I can eat a bag of chips. Like that was my, in my twenties, I would eat like a pound of licorice, literally a one pound bag of licorice. And then I'd go for a run and I could do that in my twenties. So I had a high metabolism and I was an endurance runner. So I had to refill those calories, but I would just kind of out exercise my bad diet. But as you get older, I couldn't do that. Now, as your hormones change, you become more insulin resistant, your cortisol changes, your, the way that you absorb calories change the way that your body utilizes calories and creates muscles, muscle, muscle synthesis changes. So you can't out exercise a bad diet, but diet probably is the first thing we should focus on what we're eating and how we're fueling our body. And then exercise is very important, but it's not the most important. And so just understanding that. And then when we talk about nutrition, really focusing on the whole real foods. And I know everybody says this, but especially for those women who are trying to like lose weight or really conscious about their calories, a lot of times we, and I've been here, so I can speak from experience. You want the packaged food because it tells you on the back how many calories it is, right? And so, you know, shakes and bars and prepackaged meals, a whole like Weight Watchers where everything's prepackaged. Those calorie counts on the back, just in case you didn't, you never heard this before, but they can be wrong as much as 20%. So the FDA allows for a margin of error up or down 20%. So something that is hundred calories might actually be 120 calories. So if you're depending on all of those foods to tell you the right amount of calories that you're eating, you can be off by as much as 20%. That's a lot. And so, in you know, they're allowed to be wrong up or down, like under or over by 20%. And I can guarantee you, especially if it's like a healthy food, they're never going to be under 20%. They're never going to be like, oh, well, it's really only 80 calories, but we put a hundred on the bag. Heck no, it's going to be under. And so you may think that you are eating something that is a certain amount of calories and it might be a lot more. And yeah, I can see a couple of people are saying if it has a label, we shouldn't eat it. And yes, that in a perfect world, absolutely. But I'm a real person and I get busy sometimes and I have protein bars that I put in my purse sometimes. And I have, I I used to, I just threw out the wrapper, but I had on my desk going those Paleo Valley beef sticks and I have the turkey sticks and those are great, like high protein snacks, but that's in a package, right? So I'm like, oh, that's 120 calories, but it might be 140 or 150 calories. Who knows, right? So just don't fall into that trap of like thinking that you need to eat things in packages. It's so much better. Your body really prefers unprocessed food as much as possible. So the more that you can eat that's whole real foods, the better you're going to be. And so just consuming as many whole real foods as you can and not really worrying about the calories, but worrying about the nutrition. And so we really want to focus on protein. So as we age, we have a harder time with muscle synthesis. And I talked earlier about how much muscle mass we lose. And that muscle mass is what is metabolically active. So that is what is going to burn more calories per day. When we lose estrogen, it's harder for our bodies to make that muscle. And so we need actually more protein than younger people to actually have that muscle mass come back on and to actually fuel our metabolism. So we really need to focus on getting enough protein. So that is the first macro that, and I know everyone thinks I'm going to say like, oh, cut out carbs. I'm not going to say that, especially if you want to put on muscle, you actually need some carbs to help fuel your muscles. So I am not low, no carb, low carb. I do focus on like vegetables for carbs, but Protein is number one. So you want to make sure that you are getting a one gram of protein per pound of your ideal body weight. So if your ideal weight is 150 pounds, then you really need to focus on 150 grams of protein per day so that you can put that muscle back on if your goal is to build muscle. And I think anyone who has a goal of weight loss should have a goal of muscle gain, unless you're just like Miss America and you already have so much muscle on your body, but chances are if you're the average woman in the United States, you can really benefit from muscle building because that's going to help your bone density as well. Cause your muscles are attached to your bones. We have stronger muscles. You have, you have more healthy bones too. And 
When you have more muscle mass on your body, you actually are in a better hormonal state. And so what that means is that your body is more apt to be able to utilize the hormones that you make. So especially thyroid hormone exercise and muscle mass actually helps with increasing the receptor sites for your thyroid hormone, also for testosterone and estrogen. So it's really important to have that muscle mass on your body. And so very important. And when I was talking about calories earlier and the variance in the calories, that is even more important if you're shorter. So like the shorter you are, the more you're impacted by excess pounds because you have less of a frame to stretch you out. Like if you're super tall, if you gain like 10 pounds, like no one's really going to see it. But if you're super short and you gain 10 pounds, it looks a lot more evident on your body. And so super important for people who are, you know, shorter to really understand like the variance in those calories and the importance of eating whole real food. And then like weighing, I have a lot of questions that came in about like weighing ourselves and should be weighing ourselves every day or every week. That's really a personal thing. Cause like we used to call the scale when I was a personal trainer, we used to call the scale, the sad step. And because everyone get on the scale and like, it would actually change their emotions. Right. And I've been there where like you get on the scale and like, you're hoping it says one thing, but then if you feel fine, but the scale says that you gain weight, it actually automatically makes you feel terrible. And that's not a good thing to do. So if you're someone who's like emotionally affected by scale weight, I say, don't weigh yourself at all. Maybe weigh yourself like once or twice a year, but gauge on by how your clothes fit. Now, if you're just wearing like yoga pants and like baggy stuff, you can't gauge by how your clothes fit. So I recommend having like a pair of jeans or a dress, like a tight dress or something that you have to like, it's not that like, doesn't give that much so that you can see how things fit you. Yes. One gram of protein per body weight is what I said. Yeah. Of your ideal body weight. So if you are overweight and you weigh 200 pounds, but your ideal body weight is 150 pounds, then you want to go with that 150 pounds. Otherwise you'd be eating way too much. So, so I always say like, get that macro down. And then everyone's going to be different when it comes to how much carbs and how much fat they need. And some people burn carbs faster and better. Some people are better fueled on carbs and some people are better fueled on fat. And that's something that you have to see, like how you digest and how you feel better. I'm not anti-carbs and I'm not anti-fat, but I think everybody has their own unique chemistry of what works for them. But protein is the macronutrient that everybody needs, especially women and especially women as they reach menopause. So, and then like, how do you even know if you're getting one gram of protein per pound, how do you even know what you're actually eating? There's apps on your phone. If you have a smartphone or you can get it on the computer, my fitness pal is the one that I am most familiar with. There's a free version. You don't need to pay for it. There's other ones as well. Don't use it to tell you how much you should eat. Don't worry about putting in your information. It'll tell you like how many calories you need to lose 10 pounds. Don't use it for that because it's actually inaccurate. If you use it, just use it to see, okay, am I getting all my protein? Am I getting all my carbs? And if you're in our healthy hormone club, you have access to like a tracker in your member portal that comes with the program, but anyone can use any of the free apps. You can also look up calories if you want to do it manually, but that's so like 1980, we used to have to do that. We used to have to look up how many calories and how many grams of protein and then add it all up, but you don't have to do that anymore. And you only need to do that for like a week, just eat how you normally eat and put it in and see. And then if you need to make adjustments, track that until you get to where, you know, you need to be. And then don't, I don't track my food. I'll track my food. Like if I think I'm slacking somewhere or if I change the way I'm eating. So if I go from how I normally eat. And then maybe I'm going to switch to a Mediterranean diet, or I'm going to try keto, or I'm going to switch to something else. Then I'll track. So I make sure I'm getting all the normal things, but I generally eat like similar things. And so I know like, okay, this is a portion of chicken. This is a portion of shrimp. This is a portion of rice or whatever I'm eating. And so I kind of know, and you'll kind of know after you do it a little bit more, but definitely prioritize protein. The other thing about protein that a lot of people don't know is just eating protein actually burns calories. So eating fat, you don't really burn like maybe 4% of the calories from fat, digesting fat. And then carbohydrates is about the same thing, like less than 10% of the calories from that carbohydrate actually burned in the process of eating it, but protein, it's like 22%. So just the act of eating and digesting the protein 
actually burns part of the calories. So if you eat like a hundred calories of protein, by the time you're done processing it, you only net like 80 calories. So that's like awesome, but it actually fuels your body, fuels your muscles is important for your bones, your hair, your skin, all these things. So very important. What else do I have to cover? Steady state cardio. So you know, we go through all these fitness trends and like there's the cardio trend. Like just do all the cardio insanity. If you guys remember like in the fitness beach body, I did insanity and it was like, beat yourself up with high intensity interval training for hour every day, six days a week. And then there's like CrossFit and hardcore. And then, you know, there's weight training now, like weight training is like very popular and all the girls are on Instagram, like showing their butts and their muscles and everything. And that's great. I love that because it's more positive than like trying to be super skinny, but so we've kind of vilified cardio now, but I think it's really important to like focus on resistance training. So when I say resistance training, a lot of people think about like big weights And if you want to live with big weights, that is awesome. It makes you feel powerful. It is really cool. But if you're someone who doesn't want to lift big weights, resistance training can be body weight workouts, like squats and push-ups and dips and stuff like that. Resistance training can also be yoga poses or Pilates and can be bands like resistance bands. And so you have a lot of options there. It's anything that puts a load on your muscle and creates difficulty for your muscles so that your body is like, oh, we have to build more muscle so that if she tries to do this again, we'll be able to do it. And so that's really important. But then also important is slow, set, steady state cardio, like walking. And so we're not talking about like suffer fast. Like I used to be like a long distance runner. And I used to feel like if like my ankles weren't sore and my legs weren't sore and I didn't have shin splints, I wasn't doing a good job. And I had to go out and run for hours at a time, but now like walking on an incline on a treadmill for like a half an hour, yeah, that's my cardio or after dinner, going out for a walk for 10 minutes after lunch, going out for a walk for 10 minutes. So aiming to get somewhere around like eight to 12,000 steps per day or more steps than you're currently getting. And so just doing like steady state cardio, which is like zone two, which is where you can still have a conversation and it's not very taxing, but it's moving your body. And then also having like non-exercise movement. So it's called NEAT. So non-exercise activity thermogenesis is what it's called, but all it means is that moving your body when you're not like at the gym. And so this means like walking to your car, getting up and walking up and down the stairs, cleaning your house, doing gardening, going golfing, all these things that aren't considered like a workout, but are moving. And I think part of the problem in our like current society is we stopped moving. And so that is part of the reason why people are gaining weight, but it's not the whole reason. And for women, it's really, especially if you're in midlife, it's definitely not the whole reason. A lot of times it is also from not getting enough rest and recovery. So if you're somebody who is, you know, taking care of kids, taking care of parents, working a job, helping in the community, like doing all the things, you may not be getting enough sleep. You may not be getting enough rest and recovery. And so now your hormones, your stress hormones are over. You you might be like craving sugar. You might be hungry than normal. All of these things are also a problem. So if you don't have rest and recovery, either from your workouts or from your daily life, you won't be able to build as much muscle. So rest and recovery is so important taking a day off. And I say this when I actually have a hard time with having like a full day of rest. I like to do something active every day because it really makes me feel good. And so even if you were like go hardcore at the gym then have a day where you do like yoga, so that's okay to just do something restorative, sauna, yoga, tai chi, meditation, all these things are all part of rest and recovery. Oh, come on in. Hold on. We have a guest. So Paxton is here. Do you remember? So Paxton's going to prize patrol. Those of you who know Paxton, he's my son. He likes to give away prizes. So today for our prizes, you know what we have, Paxton? We have Daily Glow. So it's our multi-nutrient, which is really awesome for balancing your cravings and your metabolism. And then we also have a hormone test kit. So you can see if your hormones are causing your insulin resistance or your weight gain issues. So we're going to test your estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone with that kit. Ola. Hey, hey. All right. So how do, oh, Ola Paxton. Yes. So how do they win Paxton? 
Do you remember? You have to do. You have to do. They come over here. They can't see you. You have to do a riddle, right? Oh, a riddle. Okay. Can you tell them the riddle? That I totally saw of and totally didn't steal from the internet. <laughs> Anyways, what do you call a snowman in the summer? Okay. So, what do you call a snowman in the summer? Okay. Let's see. I see, I have the relative. Okay. Some people are kind of getting it. Yeah. Okay. We'll give them like a second. All right. I see a lot of people are, <laughs> some people are really creative too. Awesome. All right. So I say them. oh, and then everyone ditch it. <laughs> okay. So do you need to, you can't just over there. Oh, careful. You're, you're raising that. I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that. Okay, so Pat's going to pick two people. So number one. Number one is the first one. Okay, Gloria Van Brett, you're going to win our bottle of Daily Glow. So we'll, all you need to do is email our support at glownaturalwellness.com and we'll get that out. So you have to send us your address so we know where to send it. And then what's this next one? Okay. Hmm. <laughs> Are you with that? Style points. There okay. you go. All right. I think it's Nikki S N I C Q U I. You said H two O and Paxton like that. So yeah, the answer was actually a paddle, but that's right. Water, it all works. And so you're gonna win a hormone trio test. So Nikki, all you need to do is, I hope I'm saying that right. All you need to do is send your address and just let us know you won the hormone trio test on the Q and A, and Paxton picked you, and we'll send out that test to you for free. Awesome. Thank you, Paxton. I see a pitch me. If you, if, 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 next time when I come, say that sooner, I'll definitely pitch you. <laughs> awesome. All right. And then if you're watching on the replay, you can go ahead and put in the comments and Paxton will pick two people on the replay. Thank you, Paxton. Bye. Thanks. Awesome. All right. Back to the regularly scheduled program. So yeah, we love giving stuff away. Paxton, just like, can I give away some prizes? So definitely we always let him do that. So back to our conversation. So we talked about resistance training. We talked about rest and recovery. So benefits of weight training. Again, I can't like really even emphasize this enough is it's going to build your muscle mass. It's going to increase your metabolic rate. It's going to make your body in a more hormonally balanced state because of the receptors and the muscle synthesis, and your body just knows it's stronger and it's well equipped. It's going to increase your bone density. It's going to make your skin look better. It's going to reduce cellulite. It's going to just make you happier all over because it reduces, releases endorphins. So I can't really stress enough how important it is, but what does that even mean? Like to do resistance training, right? How much time do you need? How many reps do you need? And well, it really depends on like what your goals are and what you like and how much time you can fit in your day. And so I go through periods where I'm like really into the weight training and I'll go to the gym and I'll spend 30 to 45 minutes doing different weight training exercises, whether it be with barbells or dumbbells or machines and really emphasizing and taking the time with that weight training. Right now, I'm kind of in a busy state with my business. We're going to be launching a new podcast. We have a new website launching. And so what I've been doing lately is 15-minute weight training sessions. So I'll pick two exercises, a pushing and a pulling. And so weightlifting is really pushing and pulling upper body, lower body. So like, for instance, I'll do, if I'm doing legs, I'll do like a squat, a squatting exercise, a hinging exercise, like a deadlift. And so this could be with dumbbells, this can be with bands, this can be with body weight. And then for upper body, I'll do a push up and a pull up or a bicep curl and a dip or a tricep extension. And then for, uh, for my waist or abs, I'll do like a plank or some sit-ups or some crunches or the number one exercise though, in case you guys don't know for flattening your tummy. So Everybody has like that little lower body pooch, right? The little lower belly that sticks out. And that's like where your organs are. That's where your uterus is, it's where like all your reproductive organs and your intestines are. And that's why it sticks out. But how do you get it flat? How do you get like that flat, like kind of like chiseled waistline? 
without wearing Spanx or a girdle. There's actually the, these muscles called the transverse abdominis, and they really act, they're part of your core and they really act to like hold you in and to give you that more like silhouette and the more flatter look to your lower abdominals in the best exercise for that. It doesn't require gym. doesn't require weights. It's, you don't even have to sweat. It's actually called a vacuum and it's a old like bodybuilding exercise that they would do like every day in the morning and at night. And all it involves is just like sucking in your stomach, like your belly button, pulling your belly button all the way back to like as if you're pulling it back to your spine, but like exhaling out all the air and really like sucking it in and then holding it and still breathing while you're holding it, but holding it for like 10 seconds or 20 seconds or 30 seconds and doing that three or four times that really does improve your core and really does flatten your waist. And I've seen women doing this who actually, and regular women, not Instagram models, not 20 year olds, like regular everyday 40 year old women can, without losing any weight can actually shrink their waist and flatten their bellies like by one to two inches. So it's actually really helpful. I'll do another video actually showing how to do this where I'm not wearing a dress. (laughs) And so you can actually see what's going on, but you can actually look it up. You can Google it. Basically just Google a stomach vacuum and you can YouTube it. It's probably the easiest way. And you can see it's a super simple exercise. So anyway, that's like my little like secret tip for a flat belly. But when I said that, it's really important to note that you're not burning fat with this exercise. You're just building that muscle that acts as that inner girdle. And so, you know, in menopause, a lot of times women, your weight might still be the same, but you'll look bigger and you'll have more cellulite and you'll have more body fat and you'll have less muscle. So you didn't gain weight, but you actually gained fat. And so again, resistance training, super important, doesn't have to be pumping iron. It can be body weight. It can be yoga. It can be resistance bands. And then finally, I would be remiss if I did not address the importance of knowing your hormone levels. We just gave away a hormone test kit, but understanding your hormone levels, so important, especially if you're having trouble putting on muscle or losing fat. And this is because hormone imbalances really do cause changes in your body composition, changes in your hunger levels, changes in your mood, changes in your energy levels changes in your sleep, all of these things will affect your ability to burn fat, will affect your ability to stick to a meal plan or a diet, will affect your energy levels. So if you have low energy, you're going to do less movement, less non-exercise activity, you're going to do less fidgeting, you're going to want to do less, it's going to affect your sex drive and how you feel about yourself, your confidence. And all of that actually does play into how we treat our bodies. When we feel good and we look good, we actually do better. We actually make better choices. We actually feel better about how we are really behaving. And so how much the hormone test kit cost? We usually run a special. And if if you email support and it's not on special right now, you can still get it. I know my customer service team is going to hate me for saying that, but it's $149. And we actually do like the analysis for you as well and tell you exactly what your test means. And we can ship it to your home. It's actually a saliva kit. So you just spit in the little tube and then it measures the free levels of hormones, the unbound levels of hormones. And we can tell like based on if you're cycling, we're going to tell you to take your test at specific days in your cycle, or if you're post-menopause, if you have no longer have periods, you can take it any day. And that will actually give us a better idea of where your hormones are in balance or not you can go to our website and you can go into the store, into the testing, if you want to order it, or I'll put a link below when we send out the replay. If you guys are interested in the hormone test, if you have an IUD, the hormone levels will have a specific reference range for someone on an IUD or someone on birth control. And so we do take that into account when we look at your levels. And a lot of times the IUD might just be progesterone and not estrogen or testosterone. And so we'll be able to kind of tell where you're at from there. All right. I'm going to go ahead and switch gears now and answer some questions. And so let's see, let me know first in the chat, if any of this is helpful for you. I just want everyone to know that like, you don't have to just like shrivel up you don't have to give up. You don't have to just like let things happen to you as you get older. 
it used to be, so just full disclosure, when I was like 20, I thought 50 was like super old. I thought it was like the, you know, the golden girls on TV, like, like, oh my God, like when I'm that old, I might as well just like not go out anymore and not care how I look anymore and just wear like baggy clothes. But now, you know, I'm almost 50 and I, <laughs> you know, I still want to look good. I still want to wear a bikini. I still want to look cute. I still want to wear makeup. So want to wear high heels. And I don't think it's like weird at my age to do all those things, <laughs> you know, it's just kind of funny because like I used to think it was so old and now I think it's so young because, you know, my eight year, I have eight year old, you just saw him. He's super young. Right. And so I have to live to a hundred years old with energy and with my health so that I can feel good. And when he has kids and be a good grandma and all that stuff. Anyway, enough about me. Let's get to you guys. Let's see. Can you do urine therapy if you have bacterial vaginosis? I do not know what urine therapy is. So I apologize, but I am not sure what exactly that you're talking about, like drinking your urine or, so we don't do urine therapy. Maybe you need a urine test. I'm not as exactly sure. If DHEA burns, is that typical? I think you're talking about vaginal DHEA. There can be like a slight warming sensation, especially if you have a lot of irritation with vaginal DHEA, but it should like subside. If it really, if you're really sensitive down there, you could kind of cut the vaginal DHEA with some coconut oil and kind of work your way up. That could be helpful, but there is a little bit of a tingle, almost like do you guys have ever used like a lip plunk, pumping kind of lip balm that like has a little bit of a tingle? There is a little bit of tingle with the DHEA. So hopefully that's helpful. But if you're using it just topically on your skin, that should not do anything. I think you're talking about vaginal. Say so I went off birth control for the first time in about 22 years, about 10 days ago. How soon can I get my hormones checked to see where I am in terms of menopause? I'm 52. So typically if you go off birth control, like, e like even if you're like 40, so even if you weren't at menopausal age, usually it takes about three months for your hormones to normalize. It can take longer. I was on birth control from the time I was 13, not because I was sexually active because I had, you know, a lot of period problems and that was just what they did back then. And then I went off like when I was like 29. And so that was a lot of years and it took about almost a year for me to get a period again. And so it can take longer. I would say at like 60 days, you can test your hormones. If you're 52, you can also test your FSH to see if you will get a period back or not. It's a good measure of see if you're even going to, you know, ovulate or not. So the chances are you're at least in perimenopause. So you may or may not get your period back, but it's really hard to say because every woman is different but I would wait a couple months to check your hormones. Definitely. At least let's see. I've been fighting belly fat for a year. I lose weight, but never really lose the belly fat. Not so much reduction in my waistline. What can I do about that? Well, if you have not considered estrogen replacement, I would definitely consider that because that is like the telltale sign of low estrogen is that belly fat. So I would consider the raising your estrogen levels. They actually did studies on both women, like in women's studies that were over 10 years. And then also in mice, which were shorter studies where they can study more. And when the, there was the ophorectomies, which where they removed the ovaries and went into menopause, the belly fat increased. And then when they put them back on estrogen, the belly fat decreased. It does take a little bit of time and it's not overnight. And it also does require all the things we talked about today. So full disclosure, hormone therapy is not a weight loss strategy without the exercise and the nutrition and the sleep and all the things. So hormones will not cause you to lose weight, but they, but low hormones can prevent you from losing weight. So getting yourself in a hormone, hormonally balanced state gives you the best chance at building muscle and burning fat, but it's not going to do the work for you. You still need to exercise. You still need to be in somewhat of a caloric deficit, you still need to have that protein. You still need to have the whole real foods. You still need to have rest and all the other things. Is it okay to take low PM if you're on BHRT? 
Absolutely. Glopium has melatonin, which is another hormone that actually declines with age as well. It's a major antioxidant, but it helps with sleep, helps with gut health. It's anti-cancer. And so that's important. It also has a lot of calming herbs that help with, you know, your mood and your memory and also help with metabolism as well. So definitely it's totally fine. Are bioidentical is better for HRT? RT? You know, there is a controversy on this topic, but I would say absolutely. Anytime you're putting anything in your body, if it can be biologically identical to what your body expects, it's going to have better outcomes and less side effects. So absolutely. I'm a big fan of bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. I do not know why anybody would prescribe hormones that are not bioidentical when bioidentical hormones are readily available. So, so yes, absolutely. Let's see. I have a question about glow PM. Let's see. I read the email with the frequently asked questions. Let's see. Let's see. I have a question about the melatonin part of supplement. My Dutch test came back very high for melatonin, even though I've not taken it. The waking range was, uh, I'm assuming I should not take glow PM. Generally, if your melatonin is 8,723 is because you've taken something that had melatonin in it. So it's not, a, it's definitely a supplemental range. And if you do take melatonin or you took something that had melatonin in it, it will make the Dutch test look uh, very exaggerated. So you should look at all your supplements or even like gummies or if you do any CBD or anything like that, probably has melatonin in it. But yeah, there's no, like you can't overdose on melatonin or you can't like have dangerously high levels of melatonin because it's not something that stays in your body. So I don't really, I've never seen anyone who naturally makes that much melatonin. And so you should check with your practitioner and look through all your supplements. And I would generally me- recommend that you probably do have, would did take something with some melatonin in it. Now, just as a side note, melatonin doesn't work for everybody. So some people don't do well at melatonin. And, and so if that's the case, then you don't want to use glopium because it does have melatonin in it. But I would say for the majority of people, it's a great antioxidant. It's wonderful for anti-cancer. It's wonderful for gut health. It's wonderful for skin health and definitely for sleep for the majority of people. So yeah, my vitamin D level is 123. What do you think about that? You know, I think optimal range for melatonin is between 60 and 90. So if you're at 123, you might just dial back your supplements a little bit. If you're taking vitamin D every day, if you're taking like a high dose, then you might take vitamin D three days a week. And it's pretty common for vitamin D to increase in the summertime when you have more sun exposure. So you just don't need as much supplemental, supplemental vitamin D. All right, let's see. I'm going through the questions. So if you ask a question, I am going through all of them. Let's see. I have so many questions. I'm a former IFB pro figure competitor. Wow. Congratulations. So, so for those of you who don't know, I don't know what it exactly stands for, but it's a, one of those fitness competitions where you get up on stage, bigger competitors. That's not, that's like the next level up from bikini. So there's a bikini, there's figure, there's bodybuilding. So that's a lot of hard work, a lot of dedication. So you definitely know how to eat absolutely on HRT. Can't lose body fat that I gain and my muscles feel like mush. Oh no. I need help to figure myself out. So it might be, I don't know how long ago you were a figure competitor, but I know that there is a lot of crash dieting involved in that because I haven't actually competed myself, but I have worked with a lot of women who have, and I have some really good friends that are currently fitness competitors. And there's a lot of yo-yo dieting involved and a lot of like restriction. And when they stop competing, weight gain is a big problem because sustainability of a meal plan, the sustainability isn't really there for when you're on that competition diet is it really does mess with your hormones. So says you're on HRT, I would just see if you are optimal with your hormone replacement. I would also check your thyroid because a lot of the extreme sports can wreak havoc on your thyroid as well. And so thyroid is a metabolism hormone. And so I would definitely check out your thyroid and you might have to, I don't know how long ago it has been since you competed, but a lot of times you have to reverse diet back. And so slowly add things in and let your metabolism kind of come back online. It is very common for athletes. Once they stop being active in their sport 
to have this problem, the rebound. So I'd be happy to chat or, you know, look at what you're doing and see if we can kind of reverse you back to where you want to be. And, you know, I know you have really high standards for your body because you've seen your body at that elite level. And so, you know, maybe just kind of realigning with what is actual normal amount of body fat. Cause I not saying this is you, but I have, like I said, I have some friends who compete currently and who in the off season, they hate their bodies because they have what's a normal amount of body fat. Like they're like a normal person, but they're so used to seeing their body like ultra lean that they think in their mind that that's the normal. And so just kind of okay, taking that into consideration as well. Let's see. Why would a menopausal woman feel she can easily, why would a menopausal woman feel she can easily do intermittent fasting and low carb in the winter and feel hungry or need more carbs like fruit in the summer? You know, your body can handle things for a certain amount of time, but sustainability might not be there. So it might be that your body can deal with it, deal with the fasting and the low carb for a period of time. It might happen to be the winter and then you're just craving that sugar and there's more like fruit around. So I don't know, it's not really like, it's probably individual to you, but it might be just not sustainable in the long term, And that's why you have the periods of needing more carbs. And so I would say like, really consider what is sustainable in the long run, what you can do for a really long time and consider, you know, if your body is not where you want it to be, consider being more neutral with not vilifying a whole food group. But if you're absolutely where you want to be and you're happy that way, then continue. Absolutely. Awesome. Let's see. I just ordered daily glow from you, but I am wondering if it interacts with my daily one vitamin from pure encapsulation. So daily glow is a daily multivitamin and multi-mineral and adaptogenic herbs. So you don't need to take a multivitamin and daily glow because it is a multivitamin. And so I would not take both of them at the same time because it's just unnecessary and it's a waste of money. Not to mention that you'll just pee out all the extra nutrients. Let's see. And then what's the difference? Well, the one multivitamin is a good multivitamin, but doesn't have the thyroid, immune, and adrenal support that we put in the daily glow. I try to make it a as like one size or like once like a one hit wonder, kind of like everything in one. So you didn't need like all these different products. Let's see. I also take a thyroid support product. Yeah. So you don't need to take all those other products. If you take daily glow, it's your adrenal support, your adaptogenic herbs, your thyroid support. It's got your, your genema. So your craving control, and then it also has, you know, all your vitamins and minerals. So, you know, that's kind of how that works, but you don't need to take both. Absolutely not. Thank you for your work. How can you increase, how can an increase in benign keratosis be avoided when taking a replacement estrogen? That is not something that's common. So if you have a specific skin condition, then I would recommend consulting a dermatologist, but it's not that you know common for most women. So you just want to make sure that your estrogen is not in a excessive range. And so if you're, if you work with us, we always give physiological doses. So the range that a woman should have, and so you're not having any excessive estrogen. So it should not cause any problem. If you are taking a replacement estrogen, that isn't a physiological dose. And if you don't know, like ask your practitioner to test your hormone level. So you can see if your hormones are in a healthy range and you want to make sure hormones are balanced too. So you want estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone to all be balanced. Let's see. I've been able to move, lose a menopausal weight. Woohoo! Yay. But I haven't been able to shake the fatigue and sleepless nights. I'm six years post-menopausal. Well, you know, there's so many different things that could be at play here. So it could be nutrition. It could be exercise. It could be, you know, your sleep hygiene, but if it's none of those and you might can, so if you're sleepless nights, that's a reason why you're having fatigue, right? So that makes sense. We've, if we can fix those sleepless nights, we can definitely fix the fatigue. So we need to figure out why you're not sleeping. So is it a lack of melatonin? Is it low estrogen progesterone? Cause those definitely do cause less, less sleep. So most women I work with after just a couple of weeks on their hormone replacement, sleep drastically improves. So you can go from waking up 
several times a night to not waking up at all. So looking at hormones, definitely, but then looking at your environment, are you sleeping in a dark room? Are you turning off all the blue light? Are you eating something you're sensitive to? Do you have maybe yeast or parasite or something like that's keeping you up at night? Do you have any pain, sleep apnea, any of these things as well? Are there any medications that you're taking that possibly could be causing trouble with your sleep? So these are all things to look at. I don't know you personally, so I can't really pinpoint specifically for you, but we definitely can tell you that one awesome that you lost the weight, but two, your fatigue is definitely tied to your sleep issues. So definitely looking at that. Is it good to take creatine on a daily basis? Let's see. Yeah. So actually creatine has been getting a lot of press lately. It's actually really great for muscle synthesis. So taking creatine, it's usually comes in a powder creatine monohydrate. Doesn't matter what brand you get. As long as it's just creatine monohydrate, it's pretty inexpensive and you can add it to a smoothie or a shake or mix it in water. A lot of the athletes or bodybuilders will drink it while they're working out because it actually gives you more energy. It helps with ATP, which is the muscle energy within your cells. And it can also help with body composition for women. So it can help lose fat and gain lean muscle, but caveat, it can also cause bloating and water weight gain. And so a lot of women don't like taking it, but that's okay. As long as you know that, as long as you know that One of the ways it works is it brings fluid into your body so that your muscles can grow. So if you do gain some water weight and you're okay with that, the creatine monohydrate is wonderful. You need about five grams per day in order for it to work. So it can be helpful. It's also some studies saying that it may also help with bone density. So that's awesome. All right, let's see. This is just a crazy observation. Before I joined this group, I was on birth control when I switched over to try the bioidentical hormones. And wow, I was surprised how my breasts got smaller and I lost fat in my butt. Just an observation. I was 61 years old. Do you know where that is? That's actually a great observation. So birth control pills are like, I don't want to say a hundred times more potent, but they're very much more potent than hormone replacement therapy. It's really funny to me that the same doctors that are like, oh, menopause hormone replacement therapy. That's bad for you. You shouldn't do that. But here's the birth control pill. The birth control is synthetic. It's oral. And it also is so much more potent of pseudo hormones. And so that's why a lot of times you will notice that you get more normal. So hopefully that's a positive losing fat in your butt because some women want more fat in their butt, but hopefully that's a positive, (laughs) but it's because you weren't getting overloaded with synthetic hormones. How do we know we are losing muscle mass? You can use a, you can do a DEXA scan. You can use one of those bio impedance scales that you can find at gyms and health food stores, or you can buy one for your house. My friend, JJ Virgin, she always recommends the Tanita T I think it's T A N I T A, which will measure your roughly. It's not like super accurate, but if you do, you always use the same scale. You can get an idea It'll measure your water your lean mass, which is your bone and your muscle and your fat percentage. So that gives you an idea you can usually tell if you're losing muscle mass, because you'll notice you're more jiggly, you're less solid. You can see like you're, you have lots of a shape, like your thighs are less shapely. Your butt is less shapely, everything more sags. That's how most people know, but you can definitely do a DEXA scan if you want accurate or use a bio impedance scale or get like a body scan at like a health food store or gym. That's the best way to know. Let's see. I'm 68 years old, active physically. The expanding waistline is troubling. I've always exercised and watched what I eat. I know I'm overweight at 5'2 and 146 pounds. I'm curvy. Is there a point in time when the hormone change stops? I'm postmenopausal and also do weight training. So it sounds like you're doing a lot of great things. You may just want to track your food because even if you're eating healthy, You might not be getting enough protein. You might be getting too much of something else. So I would definitely look at that. You might be eating too little. So you might be not able to gain that muscle to increase your metabolism. So the hormones don't ever change back. Once we stop making estrogen and progesterone, we generally always stay low until we, unless we replace it. So that belly fat might be due to that hormone change. The fact that you now don't have the estrogen. So your body's going to store more fat in your midsection. 
could be part of it. Can you do this without hormones? Absolutely. You can. There's plenty of women around the world who don't take hormone replacement therapy who are lean, but it's really a, up to individuals. So there's nothing wrong with having a little bit of belly fat. I'll say that like I'm not saying everyone has to be super lean, but if that's what you want, you can try maybe changing up your weight training a little bit, especially with weight training. There's something called progressive overload. And so your body gets used to things after a while. So you actually have to change the programming. So the types of exercises you're doing, you have to change the weight. You have to change the number of reps. You change the intensity or the speed at what you do. Like if you're doing a bicep curl, you can do a super, super slow, super, super slow down. Right. So that's like one way to do it, or you can do fast ones, or you can do heavier ones, or you can do more reps, or you can do a different exercise for your biceps, like a chin up. And so your body might be just getting used to the exercises. So you may be not feeling that struggle. You maybe haven't been sore in a while. So possibly think about switching up the exercises that you're doing. If you've been doing this for a long time, so that, that alone can be super helpful. Maybe adding in some cardio, maybe adding in some plyometrics or vibration plate training. I really love the power plate, which I have here in my office and just standing on it for 10 minutes. It works muscles that you don't usually work because it's moving all of your muscles in this vibration and they, all your muscles involuntarily have to tense. And it's a really cool device. And they have those at some gyms, some doctor's offices, you can also buy them for home. So that's an option as well. But I would first start by switching up your exercise routine. I would look at your nutrition, put it in my fitness pal, see if maybe you're missing anything. And if you're open to it, consider testing your hormones and possibly replacing your hormones because that alone can really help. Plus it's going to help with your bone density and not to mention women who replace their hormones live seven to 10 years longer than women who don't. So that alone sold it for me because as you know, my son is eight years old and I'm almost 50. So I have to live to 110 at least in order to really be part of his life. And so that alone is a reason why I'll use hormone replacement therapy, but then also the collagen loss and the loss of elasticity in our skin. So I don't want to have to go get a facelift. <laughs> I'd rather like have my body produce my own stuff. I like to work out. So the energy it helps and the mood and the better sleep and better recovery and all that stuff it, that sells the hormone replacement for me. But so I would definitely recommend it for multiple reasons, bone density, longevity, all those things. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. It's because estrogen reduces inflammation. It is, it helps our muscles contract. It helps us with better sleep. So all these things, just a reduction inflammation alone big thing. It also helps with blood sugar balance and heart prevention of heart disease presents with Alzheimer's. So all these things are like the big reasons why women die. So if we can prevent those and prevent having to take medication, it's amazing. And then if we also look better in the meantime, you know, I'm totally for that. Any per just postmenopausal hair thinning suggestions. So hair thins for a variety of reasons. One is stress. Two is nutrient deficiency, protein again, low protein will definitely cause your hair to be thinner. Also minerals, magnesium, biotin, calcium, all your minerals are really important too. There's a genetic component. So some of us are programmed to lose our hair earlier than others. And there's not a lot you can do. Our follicles have a lifespan. So it could be partly, partly hormonal. So a lot of times when estrogen drops and progesterone drops, our testosterone is still produced by our adrenals. So we still have decent level of testosterone and that causes what's called androgen dominance. And that can cause male pattern baldness and cause thinning of the hair. So that's one reason thyroid, low thyroid, very common for women postmenopausally, whether or not you have an estrogen problem or not, you can still have a thyroid problem, hypothyroidism or Hashimoto's thyroiditis, very common often missed because a lot of symptoms are very similar to menopause. So women will go to their doctor and say, oh, you know, my hair is falling out. I'm gaining weight. I'm tired all the time. And they're like, oh, you're just in menopause. There's nothing that's just suck it up. But that's also thyroid symptoms. So low thyroid symptoms. And that could be a reason for hair loss. It's really a big reason. Also stress, not sleeping well, being stressed out your hair, what's happening with your hair. So if you notice you're losing hair today, 
it's depictive of what happened three months ago because hair has a three month life cycle. So whatever you're doing three months ago is what your hair is going to do today. So if you start eating healthy, you start eating your protein, you start getting your sleep, your hormones are balanced. You fix your thyroid in three months, your hair will start growing back. If none of that works and it's just genetic and your mom's side of the family started losing their hair at 50 and your dad's side of the family, they were going bald even earlier. What you can do is there is over the, it's actually over the counter now. It used to be a prescription, but minoxidil, you can get it at Walmart, Amazon, any of these places. It's topical and you just put it on the areas. It's like a liquid. You can also put it in a spray bottle. You put it on the areas where your hair is thinning in about three-ish months, three to six months, you'll notice the hair starts to grow back. So it'll start with little baby hairs. And then you'll notice your hair starts to fill in. The downside is that you have to keep using it. So it's very inexpensive. It's over the counter. It, there's a women's kind and there's a men's kind. The women's is a lower strength, but you can get the men's kind. There's no like overdosing. Just be careful because if you spray it on your forehead, you might start growing hair on your forehead. So you want to spray it on the right spots, but it does work for 90% of women. So it's not natural. <laughs> I'm a naturopathic physician, so it's not natural, but if losing your hair is causing stress and causing you to hate your life and not making you go out and enjoy things and making you stay home and be embarrassed. I'm all for, you know, go ahead and use the minoxidil if you want to. Yeah. So I was suggesting do it looking for the vacuum, the stomach vacuum on YouTube, just Google or YouTube stomach vacuum exercise tutorial. And you can find that it's not me. I haven't done one, but I can do a video with some of my favorite exercises. That's something that you guys are interested in seeing how I work out. I'm not the best YouTuber as when it comes to like filming myself, like I do these videos where I'm sitting at a desk and that's great, but I'm still learning. I'm still learning how to like actually film myself doing stuff. So I'll get there. But if that's something you're interested in, definitely let me know. You can use the minoxidil on your eyebrows too. I actually have microblading. So if you guys know what that is, it's like they they make little, like, I don't know, it's little needle scratch marks and they put like, you know, it's like a permanent tattoo. Cause I lost, I had Hashimoto's for like 20 years undiagnosed and I lost the majority of my eyebrows. So these are fake. <laughs> I do have some hair growing back, but I did lose the ends of my eyebrows. So if you're wondering about that, if you've ever seen pictures of me, I was like, what happened to her eyebrows? It's cause I don't have them. I didn't have them done. Let me keep answering questions. Let's see, is sugar from dry fruits the same as fresh fruits? It's the same sugar. Um, actually, let me preface this. If you get dried fruit, a lot of times they add sugar to it to make it taste better. But when you dry the fruit, it removes all the water. So now like you have this like plum that is like very satisfying to eat a whole plum. And then it becomes a prune, which is like so small. And you're going to end up eating three to four to five, where you might've only ate one plum. So it's a lot more calorie dense and you're going to get a lot more sugar eating dried fruit than if you would have ate a whole fruit. So I'm not a big fan of dry fruit because they, it is really easy. It tastes really good, but it is really easy to eat so much calories and you don't get the hydration from your food that way either. So I recommend if you have the, all, if you can choose eat fresh fruit over dried fruit, but if you don't have a weight problem at all, and you're trying to gain weight, dried fruit is great. Awesome. Let's see. Oh, okay. How to prepare your favorite healthy salad, healthy snack. Oh, these are great. You guys keep these coming, these YouTube video suggestions. So I really want to know what you guys want to see. And if it is me doing stuff and how I prepare my meals and how I pack snacks to go and how I do workouts, definitely. Or if that sounds super boring, let me know that too. <laughs> Let's see. Would you address a sudden 25 pound weight gain over six weeks while I'm mold detox? Yes. I'm happy to address that because that happened to me too. Well, it wasn't 25 pounds, but it was 15. I was exposed to mold in 2019 while we were in Puerto Rico and we were staying there for about six months and there was mold in the house we were staying in. And then we moved to another house and there was mold in that house. And yeah, I gained like 15 pounds, maybe it was 20 and I was getting really congested and it was just really horrible. I didn't know what was wrong with me. I checked my thyroid. It wasn't my thyroid. I checked my hormones and I was working out 
I was eating healthy. I was eating the same. I always eat. I was actually doing working out harder because I was trying to combat this weight gain. And it was, I figured out it was the mold and I, I have the genes that there's certain people that have a genetic tendency where they don't detox the mold very well. And so the good news is once I was able to get out of the situation and I put myself through a little bit of a mold detox and I did sauna and I did some like toxin removal, like it was called cyto detox, but it was fulvic and humic acid with activated charcoal and glutathione and NAC and some things like that to help pull that mold out. It actually, the pounds came right back off. So just make sure that you get yourself out of the environment and go through a mold detox. You might consider running a mycotoxin panel. There's a test that you can do to check for mold inside your body to see what type of mold you have, and you can get more targeted treatment. We do offer that in our clinic. So if you are interested in that, you can definitely email us, but most functional medicine doctors who are call themselves functional medicine doctors or naturopathic physicians. So either of those two types of doctors, most of them will understand mold detox and will know how to run a mycotoxin panel. So I recommend that. And also check to see, make sure that you understand where the mold was coming from. I'm assuming you know this, but make sure that it's, whether it's in your house, that you get that remediated, you have to get out of the environment. You don't want to detox your body of mold and then, you know, not be able to that, like go back into that same environment and then retox your body. Let's see. I hear in research, I hear in research so much on when to do cardio and when to train, how to train to not raise cortisol. Let's see. I'm so frustrated. I eat clean, pretty much work out five days a week. My back fat is so bad. And I feel like I lost my identity. Yeah. So I would say for as far as cardio, not to raise cortisol. So you can do cardio, just like don't overdo the cardio. So like doing like walking on an incline or doing like, if you do the Stairmaster, do it at like a slower pace so that you're not like exerting yourself. And then making sure you're getting plenty of rest as well. So you can totally do cardio, but not like the 60 minute hit workouts or the like hardcore runs every day. So you could totally do cardio, but you don't need to like overdo it. So I would definitely run your hormones though, at least. So I think that you're the fitness competitor, right? Let me just double check. Yes. Okay. So, so I make sure I got the right person. So I would definitely run your thyroid run all your hormones. Chances are you might have put yourself into like a Hashimoto state just from the, the trigger of the hardcore workout. So that alone might be able to help you like majorly also check to see if you have any gut issues or anything like that, because that can help as well, but there is an answer here. So what I don't want you to do is like keep beating yourself up because it sounds like you're doing most of the things. And so there could be an underlying reason, like either a thyroid or hormone imbalance, that could be curtailing your ability to get to where you want to be. And so it's very common actually for ex fitness competitors to have thyroid conditions. So definitely take a look at that. Do you have any advice for reducing cortisol, increasing estrogen, and you have experience with persistent during perimenopause? So it, reducing cortisol is good. There's lots of things you can do for reducing cortisol. Adaptogenic herbs are wonderful. Stress reduction, wonderful. Walking in nature, making sure you're not over restricting calories. So getting like regular meals, not having coffee until you've eaten something, or if you can avoid coffee for a little while until you bring your cortisol levels into normality, that would probably be awesome. So maybe doing like a holy basil tea, holy basil is a wonderful adaptogen to help with stress reduction, making sure you're getting plenty of sleep, just really all the restorative things, all the things that are going to calm you, making sure you're not restricting carbs either. So having like a balanced meal plan, like a Mediterranean plan that you get your protein, you got your carbs, you got your healthy fats, really important to kind of nourish the body back to health. And anything you can do if you have a stressful job or a stressful life, all the things you can do to de-stress, mindfulness, meditation, all those things would be super helpful. And then increasing estrogen. It's not really much, after menopause, it's not really much you can do to increase estrogen other than taking estrogen. There's a lot of like, you can do like phytoestrogens like soy, but that's not really going to significantly increase your estrogen level. Persistent nausea. 
that could be gut related. It could be something that's not necessarily to do with your hormones. It could be some other issue going on. It could be blood sugar. It could be inner ear imbalance perhaps. So if you're having persistent nausea, I would really see somebody to like figure out what the cause of that is. It could be an exposure, chemical sensitivity, something like that as well. I think I already addressed the creatine question so that was in the chat as well. So perfect. Yeah, this is, there will be a replay. Definitely. I always do a replay and we'll put this up on YouTube as well. Let's see water. Oh, that was the answer to the snowman question. <laughs> Let's see. Can you discuss the use of glow below for older women, 60 and 60? I think you meant 60 and above and anyone have reactions to it as some irritation? Yeah. So there's always a possibility anytime you're using any product for there to be a reaction to an ingredient, or if you have severe irritation, like if you guys know, if you've ever had like a scrape or a cut and they go to put the you got like the antibiotic ointment put on. It's like, it hurts a little bit, right? But then it's soothing afterwards. So anytime you put any kind of ointment on something that's severely irritated, including your vaginal tissue, it could have a little bit of a sting temporarily, but then it will help to be very soothing. The ingredients in Glow Below are super soothing. They're super hydrating. They're super clean. There's not a lot of ingredients in there. It's very small ingredients. This is my glow below. So there's shea butter, sunflower oil, almond oil, cocoa, beeswax, vitamin E, and hyaluronic acid, and then either estrogen or DHEA. So that's it. That's all the ingredients. There's no preservatives. There's no chemicals. And so all those things are super soothing and hydrating and restorative, restorative of the skin barrier and the pH and the elasticity. But it is possible. I did answer to somebody else. And if there's any burning or irritation, if it's like too much for you, you can cut it with a little bit of coconut oil, just so you're getting a little bit less of the active ingredient, a little more of the hydration or some olive oil, even just to keep to hydrate and lubricate the tissues. And then you'll be able to go to full strength after that. It's perfect for women of any age, especially women 60, 70 and above, because basically once you hit menopause and you lose estrogen, your vaginal tissues will start to dry out. You'll start to lose elasticity. You'll start to get cracking and burning and irritation. Your pH changes. So you're more at risk for urinary tract infections. You get more laxity of the tissues and more at risk for like prolapse and incontinence. And the only thing that will help is restoring the moisture, restoring the skin integrity and restoring the estrogen. And so using a topical is only going to deliver that hormone to your vaginal tissues, your vaginal and vulval tissues. So the vulva is everything outside. The vagina is the canal. So everything from the perineum back by your anus, all the way up to the clitoris in the front and all the tissue around that is the, all the area affected by the loss of estrogen. And so using something like global O it's not hormone replacement therapy, even though it does contain either estrogen or DHEA, depending on the one that you get, that hormone is staying local to the vaginal and vulval tissues. So that is just really helping that area and not really affecting your blood levels or your systemic levels of hormones. So even if you're someone who has cancer or is you know, going through chemotherapy, you can still use local topical low dose estrogen. And so that is great because it's really helpful for quality of life because it's not just about sex. It's about sitting comfortably. It's about exercising and walking and getting dressed because when those tissues get sore and lose elasticity, it can be really hard to just be comfortable. And so I highly recommend it. Can I test my hormones while on HRT and then change the bioidentical hormones? Yeah. So when we do hormone testing, there's a range for hormone replacement, and then there's a range for not hormone replacement. And so, yeah, we can test your hormones while you're on hormone replacement, just as long as like you indicate on the requisition form, if we send you a hormone test or you get it anywhere else, they'll ask you what type of hormone you're on and whether it's taken orally or with a patch or pill or cream or a pellet, they'll, I will ask you what the delivery method is and what the dose is. And then we'll be able to see where your ranges are based on that delivery method and that dose. There's different reference ranges for on hormones versus off, off hormones. There's different reference ranges for cycling versus postmenopausal. There's different reference ranges for men. And so as long as we know what you're doing, we can totally test. Yeah. 
Let's see. I started because my DEXA scan was worse. Yeah. So definitely, especially if you're talking about bone density, it's one of the main reasons why women replace hormones is for their bone density as well. But if you're talking about your DEXA scan for your muscles and your fat, it will also help that as well. What do you actually test in a hormone test? So we can test a variety of things. We can test pretty much anything, but in the specific hormone test that I gave away for free, it's a hormone trio test. So it's estrogen, progesterone, and D and testosterone. So those are the things that we test. We can also test DHEA and cortisol and thyroid and all kinds of other things as well. So if you're experiencing weight gain, what I'd recommend is testing your estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, testing your cortisol and testing your thyroid and your vitamin D. Those would be the things I would test like immediately. And then if that doesn't tell us anything, then maybe we can look at other stuff as well. But those are like the big ones for women over 40. Let's see, lack of which hormones is most responsible for hot flashes, night sweats, and weight gain around your middle. Lack of estrogen is the main culprit there for all three of those. Let's see, I'm eight years postmenopausal. What should my hormone levels look like? Well, okay, so you're eight years postmenopausal. So what is what will your hormones look like? Well, you'll have hardly any estrogen, progesterone. You might have some testosterone. Your thyroid, it's hard to say. It, it might be good, it might be bad. Now, what should your hormones be? Well, for women living on this planet earth, you should have adequate levels of estrogen and progesterone, but it's normal for you after menopause to not make those levels, which is why we see the decline of your skin health and your gut health and your body composition and your energy and your sleep. And we see women having to get on more medications as the hormones decline. So the hormone decline is inevitable all women will experience it. But since these days we're living way past menopause age, it used to be, you know, before the 1940s, you would die within 10 years of menopause. That was pretty common. But now in 2023, we're living to 90, we're living to hundred, living to over hundred. And so that's half your life or more than half your life. If you count perimenopause without adequate levels of hormones. And so that is not what we want. That's not optimal. So for optimal, we want healthy levels of hormones. Let's see what can be done for estrogen levels for, for folks in the high cancer risk. Well, estrogen does not cause cancer. So if you look at like the women's health initiative study, which is the big study that everyone got scared of hormones with the women in the estrogen group had lower risk of breast cancer, had lower cancer risk and lower cancer outcomes. So it was the fake progesterone, the progestin, the medroxy progesterone acetate, which is synthetic and oral and causes problems. That is the group that had a higher level. And so, and the hormones that were tested in that study were oral synthetic hormones made from horse urine. And so bioidentical hormones actually are cancer protective, especially if you're using estrogen that contains estriol and estradiol, which is what we use in our practice. We use a combination estrogen, which is very much cancer protective. And studies actually show that women who are, have been on hormone replacement therapy, if they should get breast cancer, they have much better outcomes where they don't have problems. They actually recover a lot faster and reoccurrence is actually less as well. So read the book, Estrogen Matters. It's written by an oncologist. It's called Estrogen Matters. And that it gives you the whole lowdown and all the science about estrogen and how it's not actually something that you can't do if you're high risk for breast cancer. Actually, it's something I would definitely do if I was high risk for breast cancer, because it gives you a better outcome. Should you get breast cancer, like one in eight women will experience breast cancer, but those who are on hormone replacement therapy have better chances for full recovery with less, you know, detrimental effects. Do all women need HRT to have bone and heart health, or is it more for unpleasant symptoms? I think all humans need optimal hormone balance in order to optimally have their health as good as possible. So no one needs to do anything. Like some people might be perfectly happy with having a slow, steady decline after menopause, like maybe they want to slow down and do less and grow old gracefully and just be okay with having less energy and being more frail and fragile. But if you don't want those things and yes, you really do need those hormones to maintain optimal health. 
Well, caveat, can you do resistance training and really optimize your diet and have good bone density? Yes, you can. So you can, there are things you can do besides hormone replacement therapy to build bone. So specifically for bone density and for heart health, if you are doing off, if you're exercising, like doing resistance training, doing weight bearing exercise, you're getting all your protein, you're eating a perfect diet, you're getting stress reduction, optimal sleep, you're not exposed to toxins. You could have perfect heart health and perfect bone health. We have other issues where you have lots of collagen in your skin and will you maybe have hair loss and some other things and me at higher risk for dementia and Alzheimer's. Yeah. But do you need to do it? No, no one needs to do anything. It's just, I believe in using, utilizing all of the things available to us to live our best life in the easiest way possible. I don't want to do as much. I want to do as least work as possible. So I want to use all the things that I can. Risks of taking hormones long-term. If you're taking bioidentical hormones at the proper dose and delivery method for you, there really are no risks of taking them long-term. The risks come into play if you're taking mega doses of hormones, if you're taking synthetic hormones, if you're taking oral hormones, those have a lot of risks associated with, not a lot, those have more risks associated with them. But if you're taking bioidentical topical hormones at appropriate doses for you, the side effects are positive. The side effects are extending your life, reducing your risk of heart disease, dementia, Alzheimer's, cancer, pretty much diabetes, insulin resistance, obesity. Those are the side effects, reducing your risk. So yeah, I, that's why I'm a big fan of hormones. You know, it definitely is a personal decision. All the things I talked about today, Besides the hormones, you can implement all those things and you can do really well. Let's see. I know I need hormones. I have insomnia, night sweats, cravings, vaginal atrophy, low libido, but my doctor has never let me have hormones because I'm 64 and have high blood pressure and high cholesterol. She said it can cause early dementia. Absolutely not true. That's, that has been debunked. That's synthetic oral hormones. If you, the thing is, okay. So there's this time limit that doctors have put on hormones saying like, once you're 10 years past menopause, you should not use hormones and should only use them for five years because they were using synthetic horse urine hormones, which are actually not good for you and did have side effects. So they only wanted women to use them for the lowest amount of time possible. Blood pressure and cholesterol actually improve when hormones are properly balanced with hormone replacement therapy. And there's study after study now that shows that improved reduced risk for dementia and Alzheimer's come with hormone replacement therapy. So you need to find a doctor who actually has had training in hormone replacement therapy because less than 20% of practicing physicians in the United States have any training on menopause or hormone replacement therapy. It's not taught in medical school. Even your gynecologist, zero training on menopause. They learn to deliver babies. They learn about periods. They learn about puberty but they do not learn about menopause and they do not learn about menopause hormone replacement therapy or the difference between synthetic and bioidentical hormones. So I would just see another doctor because most of the things that you're struggling with are one, insomnia, that's putting you at high risk for dementia right there. Not sleeping is definitely a cause of problem. The night sweats, again, the insomnia, the issues with sleeping, the cravings, the low libido, vaginal atrophy, you do not have to live that way. So definitely there's hope for you. There's no age limit on hormone replacement therapy. There's no age limit. And so, yes, definitely. Let's see. I take daily glow with lunch and dinner instead of breakfast and lunch, a suggestion on the bottle. Can I do that? It does have, you know, herbs in there that help with energy. So if you're not having any trouble with falling asleep, I'd say, okay, that's fine to do. But if you can take them in the morning and in the afternoon, that's better because it's going to help you with energy during the day. But if you don't have any trouble with sleep, then that's fine. Does a person have to be estrogen replacement for their entire life? I read that if you get off estrogen, that your body is going to age quickly. So, okay. So the benefits of taking estrogen do go on longer. So there's actually been studies that shown that women who take estrogen for like five years have a lower risk of breast cancer than women who haven't taken estrogen at all. So you do get some benefit and also lower risk of heart disease, lower risk of, you know, that you have that benefit of like 
the bone density for longer period of time. So you get the benefit of taking it in the long term for all of those like long term chronic disease risk factors that does you do get that benefit whether you stay on estrogen or not. The aging quickly, what happens is if you get off estrogen, your levels will drop to where they were before you went on the estrogen to like, cause your body is not going to be making it. So while you're taking the estrogen, you're replacing the estrogen that your body is not making. And then when you stop taking it, your body's not making any. So your levels go in a, within a few days, your levels go back to very minimal, like almost nothing. And so then you will start to experiencing all of the side effects of having low estrogen, which is the aging rapidly and all the things, but it's not going to happen overnight. And you still do get the benefit of being on your hormones for that period of time for the, you know, insulin resistance, the Alzheimer's risk, the cancer risk, all those things. So you do get a benefit. It's not that you have to stay on it. You don't have to do anything forever. You'd never even have to do hormone replacement therapy in the first place, but you will be better off for having it for a period of time than not at all. If that's helpful. Can turmeric help with belly fat loss? Turmeric does have a lot of benefits. I wouldn't say that it's going to be the be all end all like magic pill, but you know, it is a medicinal herb. It can help with reducing inflammation. So maybe as a indirect way, it could help. Some people it helps with sleep. Some people it helps with appetite. So possibly. Let's see, how do the program assist with checking to assure one is metabolizing the hormone. I'm not sure what you're talking about exactly. If you're asking, like there's testing that can be done to see how your body is metabolizing your hormones. So hormones can metabolize down different pathways, specifically estrogen is the one that we look at the most, also testosterone. So if that's a concern, we can definitely do a test to check that. When the Dutch test will t- test the metabolites, but everyone we put on hormone replacement, we usually will support estrogen detox pathways just to ensure that it's going to be break down the same level. So we always do detox pathway support with our hormone replacement. Is there a difference between hormone testing using saliva or blood testing? So saliva tests the free hormones and blood testing tests the total hormones in the blood. So they're both decent. If you're on topical hormone replacement, it won't really show up in the blood because the topical hormones get into your tissues right away. So I always recommend either saliva or capillary blood testing for topical hormones. So creams and things like that or gels. So, but if you're never, if you're not on any hormone replacement, you can absolutely do a blood test or a dry blood spot or a saliva test to test your hormones. Let's see. I've been eating six meals a day, or should I be eating six meals a day or three regular meals? It's up to you. I noticed that women who have a hard time getting in enough protein do better with like three meals and three snacks because they're able to, they can't eat a lot at once. So I would see like what works for your lifestyle, what works for like your appetite and all that. So it's, there's no right or wrong way to do it. You can eat five meals, you can eat four meals, you can eat three meals. I don't recommend two meals or one meal because if you're trying to go for that one gram of protein per pound of body weight, it's almost absolutely impossible to get enough protein in, in two meals or one meal, because your body can only absorb so much protein at once. So I think you kind of need at least three meals or at least some snacks with high protein snacks. Let's see. Can I use daily glow multivitamin if I am borderline hyperthyroid? Absolutely. You definitely should be using it if you're borderline hyperthyroid, because it has support for, it has the selenium and it has the kelp, which it, which are going to help to support your thyroid. And also it has, you know, your B vitamins and zinc and the things that are needed to help convert your thought, your inactive thyroid into active thyroid. So I would definitely recommend it, especially if you're borderline hyperthyroid, it's going to really help. What time in the menstrual cycle should the Dutch test be taken? So on your menstrual cycle, you want to take it five days, five to seven days after ovulation, which is generally between day 19 and 21 of your cycle. Day one is the first day of your bleed. Now it's going to depend on your cycle length. Some women have a shorter cycle. Some women have a longer cycle. So you have to figure out what your average cycle is, and then you'll know you're ovulating kind of in the middle and then space it like that. But if you don't know, if you're just super regular, you have no idea, you can always do an ovulation predictor test. 
to see when you're ovulating and then take your Dutch test five to seven days after that. That's when your levels of progesterone and estrogen are going to be at their peak. So we can see where you're at. And then if you're super unsure, you can always do what's called a cycle mapping, which is going to be testing like every couple of days throughout your entire cycle. And you can see what's going on with your cycle. I really recommend that sometimes for women who are dealing with infertility or are really wanting to dial that in before having a baby. I think the cycle mapping is super helpful. Let's see. I took two rounds of antibiotics last summer, which led to gut issues and bladder infections and have been going off and on for a year now. I'm trying to avoid antibiotics because of my gut. Any suggestions? Yeah, there's a lot of wonderful botanical herbs that can really help with gut infections. So I'm not going to get into it right now because it's a lot, but we use broad spectrum botanicals in our practice to help with gut infections and bladder infections and parasites and yeast and all those things. What I would do if I were you, if possible, best case scenario would be to do like a GI map test, which is like a gut um, microbiome analysis. There's other tests too. That's the one I use most in my practice and that can be super helpful. And so just to see what's going on, like see if you have parasites, yeast, any issues going on with your bacterial balance, and then you can go from there to kind of restore your microbiome. And that will really help to kind of resolve any issues from the antibiotics. Could you please add the three dots with the chat to enable us to save the chat? Oh, I didn't even know I can do that. Let's see. Panelists and attendees can chat with everyone. Huh. Let's see. I don't see that as a as an option, you guys. Oh, save chat. I think that's just for me to save the chat, but I'll, I'll do that. All right. Oh no. It doesn't say that I can let you save the chat, but if there's anything anyone needs, let me know. Let's see, can you activate save transcript so we can review? I'm gonna send you guys a replay of this so you guys don't have to worry about transcript. Let's see. And um, thank you. Inflammation influence on weight gain loss. So inflammation is huge. So the cool thing about inflammation is if you reduce inflammation, the, inf the weight loss will happen really fast. So you gain weight because of like excess calories, that's fat gain. You can also gain weight from inflammation. That's generally like water weight, but also it can make you gain fat as well. So the cool thing about inflammation is you can lose that inflammatory fat pretty quickly. So that is great. Let's see. I've been asking my doctor for 10 years for HRT, but their view is that it's too dangerous because your doctors have not read a study for 22 years. That's why. So you really have to find a doctor who has some training in hormone replacement therapy, some education on menopause, you know, it's not, this is not 1990. There's lots of training, the North American menopause society, the American Academy of anti-aging, they all have great programs. Even Harvard has great programs for menopause health. So it's not the, your doctors are spouting information from over 20 years ago. That was, that has been debunked. It's been proven false. So they really need to read some updated information and I just think they're doing a huge disservice to you as a patient by not even offering you your options and just by not saying, Hey, I don't have any training in menopause. You should see somebody else for help with your menopause. That would be like someone coming to me with like an eye issue. And I'm a naturopathic physician. I'm not an optometrist or ophthalmologist and me trying to tell, Oh, well, there's nothing you can do for your eye. I don't have that information. I, or, Oh, you shouldn't use the laser for your eye, because I don't know that would be just a huge disservice. So they should be sending you to someone who actually has some training. What is the cause of sleep apnea? There are a lot of causes of sleep apnea. Some is structural. It might just be part of, you know, your genetic structure. It can also be from weight gain. It can be from pressure on your chest. It can be from inflammation. So there's a lot of different reasons doesn't have to be hormone related. It could be indirectly hormone related because the weight gain could be hormone related and that can cause issues. It can also be allergy related. So there's a lot of different things. I've noticed my skin is getting thinner. Any antidotes for this? Well, there's a lot of like, you know, cosmetic antidotes, of course, like microneedling and different injectables for your skin and lasers and things like that. 
One of the reasons why your skin is thinner is the loss of estrogen. So just so you know, <laughs> it's one of the big things, you know, as, are we go like this with our estrogen and then boom, after between like 50 and 52, we lose like 15% of our collagen, like boom, those two years and it just goes nose dives. And so that's why we're losing collagen and elastin, which are the building blocks of our skin and it will get thinner. So estrogen is like the best thing you can do. But then of course there's like every corner now has a med spa and they have a lot of great procedures and a lot of great things they can do. So lasers are great though. So if you can get access to a laser and it's in your budget, which is really rejuvenating for your skin, I haven't done it yet, but I really want to have done microneedling. I've done like facials and stuff like that, but there's a lot of great things that are like topical or aesthetic that you can do. There's so much a PRP where they actually dry your blood, spin out the platelet rich plasma and they apply it to your skin. It's like your own bodily fluids are the, are the medicine or it helps you to build collagen. So super cool. Very cool stuff. Let's see what other macros per day do you recommend for carbs and fats in addition to your protein grams? losing and gaining the same 10 pounds for years. So it's really individual for each person. So the protein is the one that is going to help you gain the muscle and lose the fat and build the bones and build the hair and help with your skin. And then the fats and the carbs, they have to fill in. You need those. So if your goal is, if your goal is gaining muscle, which I think it should be everyone's goal, but if that's your main goal, you're probably going to want more carbs because that's going to help your muscles fuel your muscles. And you're probably going to be in the gym more or doing more weightlifting. And so you're going to need those carbs for that energy. And then, so I would go higher carb, lower fat or equal. So 40, 30, 30, so you can go 40% carbs, 30% protein, 30% fat, or 40% protein, 30% carbs, 30% fat. Or if you want to move it a little bit more, you can keep your protein you can go higher carbs and lower fat. Or if your goal is weight loss and you're someone who's sensitive to carbs, you can go lower carb, higher fat, healthy fat. So I'm talking about avocado oil, olives, olive oil, coconut oil, nuts and seeds, salmon, things like that. So you can go lower carb, higher fat because you can't cut everything and then you'll have no calories and then your thyroid will kind of go down and you will, you'll stop burning calories because your body will kind of make yourself more efficient and lower your metabolism. So you can't cut everything. So you kind of manipulate and see what works for you. You're going to want to track. You're going to want to eat that way for a couple of weeks, see how you're doing, see how you feel, see your energy levels are, see where your inflammation is at and things like that, and then swap it out. And you might even have a food sensitivity. And that might be the reason why you're having a lot of inflammation or you're not, you're not able to lose that weight. See, I'm 83 and my mom had, or my 83 year old mom has spinal stenosis and severe osteoporosis. Is it too late for her to start HRT for osteoporosis? Well, it's kind of like this. So if you're, let's say you're 60 and you never, ever saved any money, or you never even opened a bank account and you know, you can start saving money now. And so you're going to put $10 in the bank each month but you're already 60 and you've never saved any money. So it's going to be really hard to build that up. And same thing with the osteoporosis and the bone, her bones are probably super brittle right now, right? Severe osteoporosis. So the HRT will help, but it's, it would have been better if she would have done it earlier. So it's never too late. The it's, I wouldn't recommend the 60 year old to not open the bank account but I'd say it would have been better if you could have done it, started when you were 20. Same thing with the osteoporosis. Yeah. The hormones can help, help her to be able to start doing those things, but she might even, it might even be really hard for her body to at 83. I say like after 80, you have to go slow on the hormones. So you go lower dose and let her body get acclimated to them before you put her up to a full dose. So it's not that she can never do it. Like I said, there's no age limit, but is it going to, Builder, it does take some time. So it takes like a year to 18 months on estrogen replacement before you see a difference in your DEXA scan. And you also have to do some kind of weight bearing exercise as well. So it's possible, but it's not the best scenario is what I should say. Does your office offer, offer Hashimoto's testing? Yeah. So Hashimoto's testing is super simple. The thyroid testing, you're going to want to look at 
a full thyroid panel. So you want to look at TSH, free and total T4, free and total T3, or just at least free T3. If you want reverse T3 and then for Hashimoto's, you want your antibodies. So your TPO, thyroid peroxidase antibodies, and your TBAG, your thyroglobulin antibodies. So you want to look at that. You can order them on like from our website. We go to glownaturalwellness.com, go to the shop, order it. You can email support at glownaturalwellness and we can help you with that. If you want to go less and you just want to know if you have Hashimoto's, you can probably go TSH, free T4, free T3 in the antibodies if you're trying to save money and do it that way. So you can go there and get that checked. It's not absolute. So you can have antibodies and not have Hashimoto's, but it's pretty good measure. You really have to look at the thyroid itself because Hashimoto's is basically autoimmune condition where your body attacks the thyroid. And then you end up with a lot of white blood cells in your thyroid. And that is what the Hashimoto's is. It was named after a Japanese doctor. That's why it sounds like some kind of like, <laughs> like something, some kind of game or something, some Japanese game, but it's a Japanese doctor that is named after. Can you use HRT after 64? Absolutely. We have many women, late sixties, seventies, early eighties in our hormone, healthy hormone club. So it's absolutely can be done. Let's see. I'm a Southern girl. I'm saying that when <laughs> saying we drink buttermilk, is that something that's good to drink every day? Oh my gosh. I am embarrassed to say, I do not even know what buttermilk actually is, but it doesn't sound super healthy. <laughs> I would say, but it might have a lot of protein in it. So if you don't have any sensitivity, a lot of people are sensitive to dairy products. If you're not sensitive to dairy, it's not like butter inside milk, right? It's just, it's milk, it's type of milk. Maybe I would go like straight, like grass fed cow or goat milk. If you're not sensitive to dairy. And if you are sensitive to dairy, get rid of it. If it's working for you and you feel great and you're at your ideal weight, it's okay. You can do it. Everything in moderation. I believe in the 80, 20 rule. So 80% of the things that you do are going to be beneficial and on track and super healthy. And the other 20% is for fun. So if you want your buttermilk to be the 20% fun, go for it as long as it's not hurting you in any way. Let's see. If one has estrogen dominance, is it okay to be on glow below? Absolutely, because it just stays local to the vaginal tissues. So it does not go systemic, will not increase your overall levels of estrogen. Let's see. Thanks for the answer to weight gain during mold detox. You may want to answer this in email. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so I will download this. Let's see. Okay. Weight is not moving. Yeah. If you want to actually, Joanne, if you want to email support at Glue Natural Wellness and just let them know that you have a long question that I wasn't able to answer during the Q and A, when I say them, I mean my customer service team and just please just copy and paste your question in there. Support at glownaturalwellness.com. I'll try to take a look at it and give you an answer. Cool. I don't want to, the reason why is because it's really boring for everyone else to watch me reading a question. So I try to answer the questions that I can get to pretty quickly. Let's say using estradiol pellets and Prometrium Pro, why levels not tested? Does it matter? Yes, I would definitely test your levels. It's possible to be at unhealthy ranges. And that is why hormones get a bad name because especially pellets tend to be mega doses of hormones. And I just always recommend testing to see if you are in healthy ranges, because that's the idea you want to be in healthy ranges. If you feel great, do you have to get tested? Maybe once a year. So don't worry about it. If you feel amazing, then just ask your doctor to test you once a year, just to make sure everything looks good. Let's see. I'm using estradiol vaginal cream for a year. I use TGE cream twice a month. I've noticed in the past four months when I use it, very bad hot flashes about a week. Should I continue to use it? I would check with your prescribing practitioner and just let her know what your symptoms are. And she might adjust to what she's giving you. I don't want to mess with somebody else's prescription or dosing. And I can't tell you whether you should continue using it because I don't know the rest of your story. What is a normal dosage of topical hormones? It's going to be different for every person based on what they need, based on their current levels, their symptoms, and what their body actually acclimates to. We adjust levels as needed. Some One woman might use, let's say, one milligram of estradiol and another woman might need 0.25 milligrams of estradiol and they both have symptom relief. So it's really individual to each woman 
what she needs. Even like you can be the same age, the same height, the same weight, the same starting hormones. And one woman would need four times the amount that the other woman needs. So yeah. Oh, thanks for sharing, enlightening me. Buttermilk is a fermented dairy product. Yeah. So, okay. If you feel fine on your buttermilk and you're at your healthy weight and everything is good and you don't have a lot of inflammation, go for it. And that's what I say. But if you feel like there's something off, if you're gaining weight for no reason, if you have a high inflammation levels, if you have skin issues, gut issues, then maybe cut it out. Because, you know, top allergens, we got gluten, we got dairy, we got corn, we got soy, eggs, seafood. So those are like some of the top most common allergens that there's a wide variety of people that are sensitive to. Does that mean that you're sensitive to it? Absolutely not. I eat eggs. I love eggs. I don't have any sensitivity, but can I eat gluten without having a problem? Absolutely not. Like gluten causes me a lot of problems. Let's see. What is a normal dosage? I just answered that one. All right, you guys, I got through all the questions. I'm going over to the chat now. I'm actually starting at the bottom. So I'm working my way up. Should we be cautious about grass fed cow's milk that the buttermilk comes from? No. So grass fed milk is actually amazing. Grass fed cow products beef, milk, if you tolerate them. So if you do not have a dairy lactose or casein allergy, then that can be a great source of calcium, a great source of protein, a really healthy part of a diet. So I don't have a problem with that at all. My son and my husband drink grass fed milk and they love it and they don't have any issues with it. And I wish I could, cause I can't, so I don't. So it depends on your heritage. A lot of times, like if you're from, if your ancestors are from like Scandinavian countries or like countries where it was really cold in Europe, a lot of times you have the genetics where you can actually digest dairy. And I had uh, issues with gluten. And a lot of times when people have issues with gluten, they also have issues with dairy. So I have to be kind of careful what I eat. So you just don't know that about yourself. Let's see. Are oral bioidentical hormones sufficient? I do not ever recommend oral estrogen. Oral estrogen comes with some health risks, oral progesterone in the spine. So that's the only thing. Goat milk can be much better tolerated. Actually, you're correct. So you can totally get goat milk if that's not an issue for you. Yes, there's Rachel Roberts puts on realmilk.com if you want healthy sources of raw milk in the United States. And there's some places where raw milk is outlawed, which is absolutely insane, but that's what people used to always have, like who had their farms. So yeah. What can help with chronic gas? Definitely looking at what you're eating. Like, cause there's definitely probably a sensitivity there could be milk, but it could be something else. It could be something totally off. Like could be nightshades or it could be garlic or it could be who knows onions or cruciferous vegetables, which are amazing, but they do cause gas. So Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, broccoli. So look at that. Also consider a digestive enzyme when with your meals. So there's a supplement and they contain like lipase, protease, things that break down carbs, fats, and proteins. And so I would look at taking a digestive enzyme, looking at your diet to get to the root of it. And then you can do something like activated charcoal if you need to like get rid of the gas. Also like ginger, dandelion, bitter herbs can help like things like chamomile and ginger tea at night can help kind of soothe the gut and help deal with some of that gas. Is it helpful to take collagen powder? Yeah, I've actually seen some really great studies showing that collagen powder is you know, a great source of protein and can be helpful for a lot of things. The jury's still out whether it directly helps with skin collagen any more than actual protein does because it's a it has to be broken. It's a protein has to be broken down to its amino acids and then it helps with the collagen. So actual protein in your diet has to also be broken down to amino acids to also help with collagen. So the jury's still out, but there's certain types of collagen that are better than others. So yeah, I take collagen. I like collagen. I, I think it really does help, but I, the science doesn't really say whether it's, it is any better than just straight protein. So yeah. Where do hormones, where do those hormones change me from? Don't understand that question. Let's see. 
What about taking supplements of collagen? Oh, I just answered that. Yes. Is there a specific type of collagen to build up thinning of the skin? It's actually just the protein that helps with it. So if you get enough protein, you don't need to add extra collagen, but if you have trouble getting enough protein, collagen is a source of protein, but it's also good for your joints. So I think I take collagen from vital proteins. There's like a professional line and then there's like the regular line. Either one is fine. There's also a collagen. I, everyone makes a collagen now. Native Path is a good brand. Mind Body Green makes a collagen. That's pretty good. There's also one that there's a Verisol. There's a kind of collagen called Verisol collagen. So V-E-R-I-S-O-L. I can't remember the brand names that carry it, but we can see, I think the vital proteins, their higher level one has the Verisol protein that has more studies on it. Not saying it is better, but it has more studies. And did you say you recommend one gram of protein per, per one pound of body weight? Yeah. One gram of protein per pound of lean body weight or ideal body weight. So I'm at my ideal body weight right now, which is like 125 to 130 pounds. So I eat 125 to 130 pounds of protein. Now, if I gain a bunch of weight and I was 200 pounds right now, I would still eat 125 to 130 grams of protein because that's my ideal body weight. So hopefully that makes sense. If you don't know your ideal body weight or you've never been your ideal body weight, roughly, if you do 100 grams of protein at five feet, so if you're five feet tall, hundred grams of protein, and for every inch over five feet, five more grams of protein. So if you're five, two aim for 110 grams of protein, if you're five, five, like me aim for 125 grams of protein, it's not going to be exact with your ideal body weight. Some people ideal body weight might be 140 pounds and they're five, five, but if you eat that amount of protein, you're going to be good. Oh, thank you. Tracy Hodge put in the chat estrogen matters link. So on Amazon, the book estrogen matters written by a gynecologist, just to educate you and your doctor about the benefits and of estrogen and how it does not cause cancer. So it's called estrogen matters. There's also a really good paper that you can look up online for free written by Dr. Devaki Berkson, and it's called estrogen vindication, estrogen vindication. This doctor, she's a crazy, excellent researcher. She's looks super young, but I think she said she's like over 70. I could be wrong, <laughs> but I hope I didn't just age her, but she actually has had breast cancer. She's done tons of research. She's an expert on female hormones. She's been like at the think tanks where they've actually done the research on these hormones. So I highly respect her. But if you look, she wrote a paper. It's like a three-part paper. It's called Estrogen Vindication by Devaki, D-E-V-A-K-I Berkson. So if you just type in estrogen vindication, so much good information there. Let's see. But I really like Estrogen Matters. It's written in plain English. Let's see. I'm going through the chat. I think I got most of these things. Okay. Someone said enable attendees to, to save the chat. I will look that up in my settings. I might have to do it before I start the session, but thanks for letting me know that homeopathic progesterone. I don't think there's such a thing. So I, I don't think that it's not actually progesterone. Yeah. I don't think that is a thing. And I actually uh, did study homeopathy but there's no such thing as homeopathic hormones. To my knowledge, there might be something marketed as such, but don't believe the hype. Let's see. I came in late. Will you go through your meal plan from when you wake up to when you go to sleep? I would do that in a separate video. So I think that's a really good idea. I've thought about doing things like that, but sometimes I think like, who wants to see that? Like my life is so boring, but I will definitely make those videos if that's something that you definitely are interested in. We have homeopathic progesterone D4. I've never heard of that here. It might be in another country, but I don't think it's a thing. I'm not really sure, but I could be wrong. So if you want to send me some information, I'd love to see it. All right, you guys. So I, if you have more questions, I will be sending out the replay of this by Monday and I will post this up on my YouTube as well. So please help share this with other women, let them know about me and my channel, let them know they can come and ask questions whenever they want. 
And I really love getting the feedback from you guys and learning about what you're struggling with. And let feel free to post below the video if you have any other questions. I read every single question under my YouTube videos and personally answer them. That's not someone on my team. That's not some random person. It's actually me because I really, I love to do you guys. So thank you so much for being here. If you're interested in the healthy hormone club, we have a wonderful free masterclass. that will teach you everything you ever wanted to know. And maybe some stuff you didn't even care about hormone replacement therapy. You can find that at freehormonemasterclass.com or glownaturalwellness.com slash hormone masterclass. So you can go there and check that out, or you can email us if you have questions, support at glownaturalwellness.com. We'd be happy to chat with you about hormone replacement therapy or other things you can do for gut health, mold, detox, you name it. We're naturopathic physicians. So we love doing all these things to help you. Let me know how I can help you guys take care. Have a wonderful day and talk to you soon. Bye-bye.